Hey everyone, it's that time of the week again. Uh, let's talk about what's scrabbling. <laughs> I hope you hi guys have had a good week. Uh, I know my week's been pretty sweet. It's been lots of experimentation and musically and lots of di a diverse artist range that I've listened to. I'm just kidding. I haven't listened to anything. I've listened to Leprous. But we'll get into that in a second. If you don't know what scrabbling is, it's basically where Last.fm looks at your listening history and archives it. And so you have all this cool data that you can look at, like what artists you've listened to most, what albums and what songs you've listened to most, and it'll even recommend stuff for you. So it's pretty sweet. Without further ado, let's get into this week's Scrabbled Artist. So the first one, as I'm sure you can imagine, is Leprous. So Leprous is this really crazy progressive metal band that uh, even though they use a lot of influences that are... Uh, sometimes obvious, the way that they structure their songs is very unique and almost avant-garde. They put together these really weird compositions, especially on their uh, second album, Bilateral. Uh, their sound, it, it combines this uh, heaviness with this also sort of weirdness. Like, there's a lot of people who say it sounds like Mr. Bungle at points. And they also uh, experiment a little further, and on their next album, Cole, uh, they sort of stripped back their sound and use these really, really skeletal song structures, but it still sounded really heavy and full with these really crazy vocals that uh, their lead vocalist does. He has a very interesting approach, which comes off as very moody and dramatic, and at times he can get into these really aggressive, harsh vocals. And he also uses a lot of vocalizations. And so, for example, at the very end of Foe, the uh, intro track for Cole, the, he just does this vocalization for the last two minutes or so. Some tracks that I really love by them are Mediocrity Winds and The Valley. I'm really into Mediocrity Winds because it has this really weird and funky kind of swing to it. Which is another thing that is, is kind of weird about them, is that they a lot of their songs have this really swingy sort of feel to it, like Chronic Off of Coal and Mediocrity Winds and a few others. And the thing is, they do it in these really weird time signatures. Uh, there's a lot of 7 eights being thrown around, which I think is really cool. There's also a bit of a 6 eights, although sometimes they will use typical signatures, but they'll just put really complex and weird rhythms inside of it. I'm really mad at myself for not listening to them earlier because they're an amazing band. All right, next on our list is Godspeed You Black Emperor, which are a very avant-garde uh, post-rock band from Canada. And they, are, they specialize in creating these really huge sweeping soundscapes that really give the feeling of you're in the middle of the apocalypse, and this is like sort of the soundtrack to that. And I've been listening to F-sharp, A-sharp, Infinity a lot, which is now one of my favorite albums. It has such a heavy and powerful atmosphere, and it's just so evocative, like more than any album that I've listened to recently. You just get immediately so sucked into this really bleak and terrifying and desolate world that this album exists in. And even though it takes a little bit of patience to really get into their music, it's definitely worth it. Because not only do they create these soundscapes, but when they're not doing that, they are very good as a band. They have these post-rock sections that are just beautiful and really contrast the stark and terrifying sort of soundscapes that they create. Next, we have Fair to Midland, which is a kind of weird 90s-ish sounding rock group. The, their sound reminds me a lot of Stone Temple Pilots a bit. They have this one album from 2007 or so called Fables from a Mayfly, which I'm super into. It, it has this really kind of weird quirky 90s sound to it but it's done in a way that sounds really fresh and really uh cinematic almost and they're really good at just kind of uh creating these atmospheres and mental imagery the vocalist has this kind of like weird grunt that he does sometimes and i'm not a big fan of that it kind of sounds like an off-brand mastodon or something like that sometimes he'll do these high-pitched falsettos that just sound awesome especially on the intro track to fables from a mayfly uh god what's it called dance of the manatee this band is pretty good if you can sort of stomach that sort of 90s rock sound that they definitely pervades their music. If you are like absolutely sick of it, then you probably won't find much to like here, but there are elements of all kinds of different uh, genres sort of coming together really nicely. So you have this like sort of 90s grunge sound that comes along with this like kind of melt of the pop punk sound. And sometimes they go into like kind of heavier uh, system of a down style passages. The last album that they released was probably like 2011 or so. And I don't really care for that one much. It kind of lacks the youthful exploration that uh, their debut album had. And so I usually just stick to this album. 
And plus, there are some, like, actually really bad songs off of their uh, second album. If you get, if you do check these guys out, I would strongly recommend you stick with Fables from a Mayfly, because that album fucking rocks. After Fair to Midland, we have Seventh Wonder. I'm a really big fan of their music, especially The Great Escape and Mercy Falls. Uh, I also really like their debut album, although it does have a distinctly different sound because they had a different vocalist back then. It was before Tommy Karvik joined the band. And the dude is really good, but it just it's just a different atmosphere than the later Seventh Wonder. The dude almost kind of reminds me of Freddie Mercury if he did, like, progressive metal, which is really cool. Like, the dude has an amazing voice. Tommy Karvik is an amazing vocalist, though, and his work in Seventh Wonder really sort of helps to bring out uh, his vocal prowess. More than in Camelot, I believe. I'm not a tremendous fan of Camelot. Uh, I kind of was when uh, Roy Kahn was a part of it, but I'm really not crazy about Karvik era Camelot stuff. I much prefer Seventh Wonder. But this album is full of really epic power prog metal. Uh, it kind of kind of gets a little tropey a little bit. There's a lot of parts where, uh, like on the second track, where there's this intro and there's just like this ridiculous shredding, which seems kind of like unnecessary. And the lyrics are like really cheesy. Like they have some of the cheesiest lyrics I've ever heard, and not exactly in a great way. I'm not entirely sure what it is about them, but just like reading them, it's like, oh god, like that's so that's so lame. Like that's so like, c- come on, guys. It's not like. It's not exactly like a fun cheesy. It's not like so over the top that it's funny. It's like right in that sort of middle area where it's like not really profound and it's not like fun and hilarious, which kind of sucks. But I mean, like Tommy Carvick's vocal delivery is good enough to where it doesn't matter. All right. After Seventh Wonder, we have Earth, which are a really, really uh, influential doom metal band. They actually kind of spurred uh, Sun to start making their music and... They're the ones who are sort of like the proponents of this really, really heavy, slow, crushing doom metal. And so I've been listening to uh, The Bees Made Honey and the Lion's Skull a lot, which is an amazing album. It's, it's weird because it has such a chilled out atmosphere and it's so kind of drawn back and slow, but yet it still sounds really heavy. And it's just such a calming and peaceful and relaxing listen. I'm, I'm really big into it and I'll probably be spinning it a lot more. There's also a bit of an element of uh, sort of post-rock in there. It's all instrumental, which is a big thing in post-rock, but it also has that same sort of guitar tone that they use, that sort of watery, uh, cinematic guitar tone. Next up on our list is Batushka, who are a uh, black metal supergroup that have this very Eastern Orthodox sound to them, which I really love. But Liturgia, which is their only album out so far, was my favorite black metal album of 2015. What these guys are doing, uh, it's not 100% original. Like a lot of it has, it falls into a lot of tropes of black metal, but they combine it with these Gregorian chant vocals. Batushka are able to create these really unique soundscapes where it sounds like you're actually in a church while all this is going on. And then, like, you know, there's some sort of like demon that makes it in. But this is an entirely solid album. All the tracks on here are really strong, and they're, they have lots of variety in pacing and uh, ways that they sort of use the chants. Like, sometimes there'll be songs where it's used very seldomly, and then you have ch- tracks like Yectania 7, which are entirely Gregorian chants. There's no harsh vocals, which usually pervade. And the harsh vocals on here are really cool. They're very harsh and sharp and uh, shrieky. Uh, the, the whole package just comes together so well, and I'm so excited to see if uh, Batushka get together and make another album. After Batushka, we have King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard again. So I'm not entirely sure how many times I would want an artist to be inside this segment because I want to use it to talk about a whole bunch of different things and not go over the same artist again. But uh, this time I felt it was okay to leave King Gizzard in because uh, last week I mostly listened to Flying Microtonal Banana. But this week I was spinning Nonagon Infinity more. This album is a lot different than Flying Microtonal Banana in the sort of atmosphere it creates and the speed and the intensity. This album is like nonstop like, in-your-face garage rock. And it just sounds like a huge jam session, and it's really cool because all these ideas that uh, span across the album sort of blend into each song. So it'll start off with this idea in the first song, and it'll blend into the next three tracks that follow after that. But as each track goes on, it sort of introduces new ideas that last as long as that one. And also over the album is this uh, chorus. Like, the the album itself has a chorus, talking talking about Nonagon Infinity. And it comes up all over the album. Uh, it's just such a cohesive album 
that uh, n- not only is like everything really, really densely related, but at the end of the album, the ideas from the very beginning of the first track come together and it loops back perfectly into the album. So technically you could listen to it forever and uh, you wouldn't be able to sort of find any sort of musical beginning or end. I kind of don't like the fact that it starts off with robot stuff because of how like muddy and dissonant that first part is. And it makes it like the very first part you listen to it, you're like, oh God, like I don't, I don't know about this. But it's all good because it all comes together in a very nice way. And the rest of the album is amazing. Uh, the rest of the track is amazing as well. Just, just everything is so good. All right, after King Gizzard, we have Tesseract. So uh, I am a huge fan of Tesseract. I fucking love their music. Uh, Altered State is one of my favorite albums of all time. And I am super into Polaris as well, which I've heard that most people don't really like. And I kind of agree with that. When I first heard Polaris, I was just not into it at all. But with more listens, it kind of grew on me, and now I love it as much as I do Altered State. And uh, I'm having the same kind of experience with Tesseract's newer single, Smile. When I first heard it, it was just like, ugh, like, this is not, this is not good. There's no grooves, hardly. Like, there's maybe one. And the production is so muddy and murky. But I think a lot of that is intentional, and I think it just sort of shows that Tesseract are going in a new direction with their sound. Something that's more focused on the vocals than it is these grooves. Because they also talked about when they were writing Smile and the rest of the tracks on this new album that they were keeping in mind relating the lyrics more to the music at hand. And so to me that speaks that they are focusing more on the lyricism and they're also focusing more on the vocals because that is sort of the medium that the lyrics come through on. And so... Hopefully it doesn't mean that the grooves are as gone or as devoid as they are on this single, but uh, I mean, it, it could be. Okay, next is Celador. It's an American power metal band, and they, uh, they're very high energy, very fun, very straightforward power metal. It's just, uh, there's no real pro- like progressive elements to it. It's just straight up like, like concentrated cheese. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Like, the vocalist is so good, and all of the instrumentation is very sharp, and the production is nice. It works well with this style of power metal. And even though it's not, you know, as diverse and progressive as the Unleash the Archers um, album, it's still amazing. It kind of reminds me of Ed Guy, especially in the vocals. Uh, they're also a little more straightforward than Ed Guy. They, uh, you know, it's just... Uh, all the songs sort of follow that verse-chorus uh verse bridge chorus uh style of song structure but i mean it's fine like uh, if you're into power metal then it's it's definitely high quality power metal uh with some really nice guitar licks and uh some really really huge choruses these guys are amazing at writing choruses both a shadow fold and wake up the tyrant are some of my favorite choruses of uh 2017 and finally on our list this week we have alcest who are also one of my favorite metal bands. I've known about them since basically I started listening to metal, and they they have a very special style of uh, post-metal and shoegaze that is very light and very beautiful. I've been listening to their latest, latest album, Kadama, which is probably my favorite right now. I think that it has the best sound of any Alcest album. It has a bit of a Japanese atmosphere that was influenced by the uh, movie Princess Mononoke with this sort of... um idea of balancing nature and industrialization and i was really excited because somebody made a sort of fan music video of the title track from kadama using clips from princess mononoke and sort of telling the tale of princess mononoke through this song and it was extremely beautiful and extremely moving but someone came along and deleted it so it's gone off of youtube now and i'm really sad so whoever made that fan video please upload it again that was it was amazing it was beautiful and I would love to see it again. All right, well, I suppose that wraps it up for this week, and let me know what you think about any of these artists, or if there's something else you would like me to talk about, or review, or listen to, uh, just let me know. I'm always excited to find and listen to new, new music and talk to you guys. All right, thanks for listening. I'll see you guys next time.